Okay, welcome to USR 2022. My name is Matt Shotwell and I chair the organizing committee for this year's conference. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to make a few announcements and acknowledgements and I'll start by thanking our sponsors. Our uh, platinum sponsor, Absalon. Uh, sponsorship supports many parts of the conference, including scholarships, human, and it's an important part of making the conference accessible to a broad audience of our users. I'd also like to thank our gold sponsors, our, the, our studio, Oracle, our silver sponsor, Microsoft, our bronze sponsors, Google and Memverge. Memverge hosting a sponsored workshop Wednesday afternoon and Thursday morning titled Big Memory Computing for R. These uh, are satellite events are free for conference participants and you can find the link to register on the agenda page or on the program overview page at usr2022.rproject.org. I'd like to thank also our small business sponsors OpaFX, Jumping Rivers, R Bloggers, and Syncra. Just after this presentation and um, talk, you can visit the sponsor virtual booth for the, uh, our gold and platinum sponsors. I'd also like to just uh, mention our posters. So uh, the posters are organized into lounges and on the left side of the homepage for Excel events, you can find the poster sessions there. Um, Within the lounges, the posters are available now to be viewed, and you can discussion later. Poster presenters will be available in their lounge live forum during their assigned time on Wednesday, tomorrow. Live sessions are noted in each lounge and on the conference website at rproject.org. Just after the first parallel talk session today at noon uh, central time, there will be a speed networking session where we will randomly pair you with another participant for three minutes so that you can introduce yourself and you can stay as long as you want. Okay, I'd also like to give a little bit of information about the, these talk sessions, including the plenary sessions, the one we're in now, and also the parallel talk sessions. All of the sessions, the talk sessions will be recorded and available to view on this platform about 30 minutes after the session and for about a month after the conference for registered participants. The tutorials will only be viewable to those who signed up for the tutorials. For presenters who agree, we will also plan to share all recordings, including tutorials publicly after the conference beginning around August 1. Uh, in order to facilitate those with difficulty hearing, we have uh, live captioning for the keynote sessions that we're in uh, and optional AI captioning, machine captioning for all other talk sessions. Uh, it's also possible to use the live caption feature in Google Chrome. If you have questions for speakers during any of the talk sessions, those questions should be placed into the Q&A box computer is on the right hand side of your screen. There's a, a tab that says Q&A and you can type. Uh, after the keynote talk, we will uh, try to address as many questions as possible. I'll read them back to our speaker and allow her to respond. And now I would like to introduce our speaker. Our first keynote speaker today is pa Paula Moraga. She is a professor of statistics at King Abdullah University. Her research focuses on developmental of, development of statistical methods, tools for geospatial analysis and health surveillance, and the impact of her work has directly informed strategic policy in reducing the burden of disease, such as malaria and cancer in several countries. Paula has worked on the development packages for Bayesian risk modeling, detection of disease clusters, and risk assessment of travel-related spread of disease. She's the author of the book, Geospatial Health Data, Modeling and Visualization with R. Shiny. And with that, Paula, I'll 
hand it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, for the introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and be able to speak about my research. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so my research focuses on the development of a statistical methods and computational tools for geospatial data analysis and health surveillance. I have developed methods to understand spatial and spatiotemporal patterns of diseases such as malaria in Africa, leptospirosis in Brazil, and cancer in Australia. And I've also developed a number of R packages for Bayesian disease mapping, detection of clusters, and risk assessment of travel-related spread of disease. And I'm the author of the book, Geospatial Health Data, Modeling and Visualization with Arila and Shine. In this talk, I'm going to talk about R for Geospatial Data Science and Health Surveillance. First, I will give an introduction to Geospatial Health Data and Methods. And then I will talk about data, analytical tools, software, and then I will finish by talking about the importance of communication and dissemination for policymaking. So I'm going to start by showing this map. This is John Snow map of cholera. In year 1854, there was an outbreak of cholera in London, and people didn't know how this outbreak occurred because they didn't know how cholera was transmitted. Dr. Jonas Snow created this map where for each of the locations of people that died from cholera, he put a, a point in the map. And he found out that all points were clustered around a water pump in Broad Street. So he convinced the authorities to remove the water pump. And when they did that, the outbreak disappeared. And this is one of the first examples on the importance of geospatial methods for disease surveillance. This can be useful to understand geographic and temporal patterns, detect clusters, identify risk factors, early detection of outbreaks, and the results of this analysis guide decision makers to better allocate resources and to design strategies for disease control. In spatial epidemiology, we distinguish three types of data, aerial data, geostatistical data, and point patterns. In aerial data, we have that the region of a study is partitioned in small areas, and in each of these small areas, we have the number of cases, population at risk, covariates, and the objective is to predict the risk in each of these small areas. When we work with geostatistical data, we assume that the risk is a spatially continuous surface that we can measure at a specific locations. And the objective is to predict the risk in areas that are not sampled. And when we work with point patterns, we have that the data are the locations of people with disease. And the objective is to understand what is the process that originates this data? Is this data at random? Are they clustered? Are they close to a contamination source? So if we have aerial data, we have the region of study partition in small areas. We can estimate the risk in each of the areas by calculating the standardized mortality ratio or SMR. And this is the number of observed cases divided the number of expected cases in the area. So if SMR is greater than one, this means that we have more cases observed than expected. So this is a high risk area. And if SMR is less than one, this means that we have less number of cases observed than expected. So this is a low risk area. These values are very easy to calculate 
but uh, they may be misleading and unreliable in areas with a small populations or rare diseases. So instead of doing this, what we do is to use models that enable to incorporate covariates and to borrow information from neighboring areas to obtain a smooth relative risks. And we use models like this. We say that the number of cases observed in area I follows a Poisson distribution with mean the expected counts times the risk. And then we say that the logarithm of the risk is equal to some covariates plus random effects. So here, the fixed effects quantify the effects of the covariates on the disease risk. And the random effects model variability that cannot be explained by the covariates. And here we can put a spatial random effect to acknowledge that two areas that are close to each other may have similar risk. And also an unstructured random effect to acknowledge that although two areas may be close to each other, they may have different risk. So, um, if we want to fit this model using R, the first thing we need to do, to do is to calculate the spatial neighborhood matrix. And this is a matrix that tells us what are the neighbors of each of the areas. And uh, here, for example, we have, we can assume that two areas are neighbors if they share a common boundary. So for example, the neighbors of area two are 10, three, 65, 63, and four. And in R, there is a, a function poly 2MB from the SPD package that if we pass the, the map, it returns a list with the neighbors of each of the areas. Then we need to fit the model. And to fit the model, we can use several statistical packages. And here, for example, I use ILLA. ILLA stands for Integrated Nested Laplace Approximation. And it's a computational approach to perform approximate Bayesian inference in latent Gaussian models. And the syntax is very similar to the LM function for linear models. First, we define the formula with the response variable, the covariates, the random effects. Then we call ILLA, passing the formula, the family, the data, and other options. And retrieve the results. So we can retrieve the posterior mean with the risks and also lower and upper limits of 95% credible intervals that will tell us what, what is the uncertainty of these estimates. And then we also need to visualize the results to communicate, um, to communicate them to collaborators or, or decision makers. And for doing that, R has many excellent packages for static and interactive visualization. Here, for example, I use Leaflet for interactive mapping. And using Leaflet, we can create maps where we can zoom in, zoom out, and we can hover the mouse over the region and, and explore the values. To create this map, first, we need to define a palette of colors. Here I used colors yellow, orange, red. Then we call leaflet, passing the map. We add tiles to put um, a background map to put data into context. Then we add the polygons, the legend, and we can also add labels with information corresponding to each of the areas. If we work with geostatistical data, we are assuming that the risk is a spatially continuous surface that we can measure at a specific locations. Here, for example, uh, we have prevalent surveys of a disease that is called lymphatic filariasis or elephantiasis. So at each of these locations, we have a survey with a number of people uh, and we test these people to see if they are positive or negative for the disease. And the number of people that tested positive divided the number of people in the survey, this is the prevalence. And here you can see that some locations have very low prevalence, other locations have higher prevalence, and then there are other locations where we don't have surveys and we don't know 
what is the, the prevalence in these locations. So we can use geostatistical methods to produce a spatially continuous surface of the prevalence that can be useful for decision making. And this is the model that we use. So at each of the locations X, we have a survey with N people and out of N people, Y of them are positive. So the number of people that tested positive for the disease follows a binomial distribution with parameters N, the number of people in the survey, and P, that is the prevalence of the disease, the probability of, of having the disease. And then we say that the log of the prevalence is equal to some covariance plus random effects. And again, in the, in the, in the covariance, uh, we put characteristics uh, known to affect disease transmission. For example, depending on the disease, we can include temperature, precipitation, vegetation, elevation, population density. And then there will be other factors that we haven't measured or we don't know how to measure or we don't know about them. And all of that variability will be, will be modeled with the spatial random effects. So if we want to fit this model using R, we can use ILLA in combination with the SPDE approach, the stochastic partial differential equation approach. And this approach approximates the continuous Gaussian random field by a discrete Gaussian Markov random field using a triangulation of the region of a study. So first we create this uh, triangulated mesh where we'll be approximating our estimates. We also need a spatial covariance that we can get from different sources. Uh, for example, the Rasta package has a function get data to download uh, several climatic and environmental variables. And here I use it to retrieve altitude in the Gambia. And then we need to fit the model. And again, if we use ILLA, we define the formula, we call ILLA, and then we retrieve the results. So uh, this was a, an overview of geospatial methods. And now I'm going to show you uh, two applications where we use these models for tropical disease mapping. So in the first application is about lymphatic filariasis in sub-Saharan Africa. This is a disease caused by microscopic worms and transmitted by mosquitoes. So when the mosquitoes bite the person, the worms go to the lymphatic system and there they cause blockages that cause swelling of the arms, the legs, and also thick and hard skin. And this is a disease that is also called elephantiasis. This disease is very painful. People with this disease are rejected by those in their communities, and this leads to a lot of suffering and poverty. Lymphatic filariasis affects tropical and subtropical regions of the world, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, the Pacific, and also parts of the Caribbean and South America. And the main strategy against lymphatic filariasis is mass drug administration. So ideally, we could give the drugs to everyone that needs them, but the reality is that resources are limited. So we need to decide which are the areas most in need. Here, we have prevalent surveys of lymphatic filariasis in Sub-Saharan Africa and we applied a geostatistical model to uh, obtain this uh, spatially continuous surface of, of prevalence. And this is useful for decision makers to allocate resources in areas of greatest need. Another example is about leptospirosis in Brazil. This is a disease transmitted by the urine of the rats or an environment that is contaminated by the urine of the rats and is an urban health problem due to the rapid and disorganized expansion of urban centers that creates ecological conditions for rat borne transmission. So in this study, we studied leptospirosis in Brazil. So we recruited a number of people, then followed them for a few years. 
and we could identify risk factors such as being male, such as being illiterate, observing rats near home or contact with mud near home, and we could also identify the hotspots. Okay, so we have seen that um, geospatial methods uh, can be useful for uh, solving global health problems, but to use these methods, we need data, and we don't need just any data. We need reliable, relevant, timely, and detailed data. For example, we need data to know how different groups are doing, and we need demographic data that are disaggregated by gender, age, geographic location, and other characteristics. And this is essential for addressing the needs of all groups, including the most vulnerable, which are often overlooked when populations are considered as a whole. And here in this study, we assessed the age and gender dependence of the severity and case fatality rates of COVID-19 disease in Spain. And as you know, uh, age and gender, uh, uh, there are big differences and, and this is uh, very useful information for uh, planning health resources. We also need climate and environmental data there are many diseases such as malaria or dengue that are affected by factors such as temperature, humidity, rainfall, and all of this information may be useful to detect um, outbreaks earlier in time. And we can also get data from digital sources. Um, for example, uh, we can get data from social media platforms where people chat about how they feel, or um, Google searches where people search treatments about their conditions. And this information is not produced for epidemiological research, but we can use it to understand disease activity levels in real time. And of course, these data also have some biases and limitations. Uh, we know that not everybody uses social media platforms, uh, mostly uh, younger people or more educated people do, and also internet penetration is not the same in all places. So when we analyze this data, we also need to take all of these uh, factors into account in the modeling approach. And we also need geographic data for planning. We need to plan how to distribute medicines or how to vaccinate people. And for doing that, we need to know where the people live, where are the hospitals, the health facilities, what are the distances between um, the houses and the health facilities. And here, for example, we have a map of a region of London. This is obtained from Google Maps. And here you can see that um, this is a very detailed map. We know uh, where are the buildings, uh, small roads, big roads, um, hospitals, metro stations. So we have a lot of details and this is very good for planning. But uh, we need to be aware that unfortunately, this is not the same in all parts of the world. And here I'm showing um, a map also obtained from Google Maps that shows a village in Mongolia. And as you can see, we only have four roads and two points of interest, uh, and that's it. So as you may imagine, this is not good for planning. So we need to be aware of this situation and improve availability and quality of data worldwide to reach all populations. So we have seen that uh, uh, to analyze uh, and to use geospatial methods, we need data. Unfortunately, there are many uh, data repositories online that provide this data. And also, there are many R packages that facilitate the access and downloading of these uh, data sets using R. We have created a website uh, called R Spatial Data that is a collection of data sources and tutorials on downloading and visualizing in R. 
And here you can find tutorials on how to access administrative boundaries with the geo boundaries package, population with WOP R, open street data with OSM data package, elevation with elevat R, temperature with the raster package, rainfall and humidity with NASA power, vegetation and land cover with Modis TSP, and also other data sets, for example, air pollution in the UK using open air and demographic and health surveys uh, with RDHS and malaria data with malaria atlas. So we have seen that uh, we are able to download uh, spatial and spatial temporal data that come from different sources and are at different spatial resolutions. And now we need robust analytical tools to analyze this data. And here I'm going to give a, a few examples on analysis that we may want to perform. So sometimes uh, we may want to combine data that are at different spatial resolutions. For example, uh, imagine that we want to estimate air pollution and specifically fine particulate matter or PM 2.5. These are very tiny particles that are floating in the air. They come from fires, motor vehicles, industries, and they are so tiny that they can get deep into the lungs and cause very serious health conditions. So it's important that we monitor uh, these levels and, and take action to reduce the levels if they exceed the recommended levels to protect uh, population health and the environment. We can get air pollution measurements uh, from monitoring stations that are placed at the specific locations. And here in this map, this map shows uh, annual mean PM concentration levels in Europe. And here we can see that um, some locations in the east and the north of Italy have very high air pollution and other locations in the, in the north of Europe have lower air pollution. So we have local information, which is good, but uh, we have many locations where we don't know anything about it because uh, we don't have monitoring stations. We can also get uh, air pollution measurements derived from satellites. And here we have, again, a map of Europe, but now we have a raster grid at a resolution of 50 square kilometers. So here the coverage is good. We have the whole Europe covered, but uh, at each of the cells of the Rasta that, I, that are at 50 square kilometer, we only have one value. Uh, so we don't know how air pollution is within these um, cells. So we may want to combine point level data with area level data and produce a spatially continuous surface of air pollution that can be useful for decision makers. A related problem occurs in disease mapping. Disease maps are very important to understand geographic and temporal patterns of diseases and allocate resources. And often these maps are given at an area resolution. Here, for example, we have a, a map of malaria prevalence in Mozambique. And here you can see that the districts in the north have higher prevalence than the districts in the south. So this is good to understand a little bit the burden of disease, but this is not useful for decision makers. Because in a given region, we only have one value. But in reality, disease risk varies continuously in a space. So we can develop methods to disaggregate area level data and produce high resolution estimates. And here in a given region, we, we can identify locations of high and low risk. And this is much better for decision makers to allocate resources in areas of greatest need. And uh, we can also have the problem where we want to investigate the relationship between a response variable and an explanatory variable that are at different spatial scales. 
For example, we can have lung cancer at county level and smoking at the state level. So these spatial resolutions are not the same. And here we need to use more complex methods to deal with the situation. So all the problems that um, I have described, we are working on developing um, our packages that, that deal with this, this type of data and able to, to fit this type of models. So now I'm going to talk about software. I also develop software so my methods can be widely available and provide benefits beyond my own applications. I'm the author of Special API, and this is a shiny web application for disease mapping, detection of clusters, and interactive visualization. User can upload the data uh, with the disease cases, population at risk, uh, covariates. Then they can also upload the map with the boundaries of the, of the region. And then by clicking some buttons, they can obtain disease risk estimates uh, by fitting Bayesian models using ILLA. And they can also detect clusters by using the scan statistics in SATSCAN. And then they can visualize the results by means of interactive maps, time trends plots, and also interactive tables. And uh, they can also generate reports uh, with the analysis conducted. I'm also co-author of a package called EpiFlows for risk assessment of travel-related spread of disease. So as you know, infectious diseases may spread beyond national borders. People living in one location can go abroad and infect people abroad. And people that come to the infectious location for holidays, for example, can get infected. And when they return to their home countries, they can infect people in their home countries. Kit implements a mathematical model that predicts the number of cases that could be spread to other locations from an together with uncertainty measures. And it uses information about the number of infectious cases, population flows, lengths of stay, and incubation and infectious period distributions. And we can also develop our packages in a collaborative way. For example, our Epidemics Consortium, RECON, is an organization that gathers experts in data science, modeling, public health, and software development to create the next generation of analytical tools for disease outbreak response using R. And RECON develops uh, many packages for uh, manipulating, analyzing, and um, visualizing spatial data. And also the APFLOWS package uh, is part of, of RECON. Also, when we develop an, an R package, we may consider submitting these packets to R OpenSci. And R OpenSci is an initiative that fosters a culture that values open and reproducible research using shared data and resolvable software. So what we can do is to, um, when we, we have finished the, the package, we can submit it to our open site to, for being reviewed. And then there will be a, an open peer review. So it will be a, an open conversation in GitHub between the developer and the reviewers until they uh, ensure that the R package has a uh, good quality and, and robustness. And R OpenSci develops a lot of packages that help researchers in their work and make science more impactful, including packages for data access, visualization, statistics, machine learning, and so on. So now I want to talk about communication and dissemination. Um, this is uh, very important for the development on, and implementation of population policies. So we can create um, um, visualizations to share our results. And R has many excellent packages for static and interactive visualizations. For example, 
we can use ggplot2 for creating graphics, um, all types of graphics, but in particular, we can also create maps like this. We can also create interactive visualizations with HTML widgets. Um, these are interactive web visualizations built with JavaScript. And here we have a few examples. For example, this is a, a map created with leaflet. And here you can see that we can zoom in, zoom out, and then we can hover the mouse to explore the area. We also have um, digraphs for uh, creating time series plots. And this is also interactive. Uh, we can zoom in the time period we are interested in. And we also have data table for representing tabular data in an interactive way. And here we can sort the columns or we can filter the rows by searching specific uh, words. So using all of these visualizations, we can explore the data in an interactive and approachable way using maps, time plots, tables, and other visualizations. And specifically, if we use maps, we can overlay uh, layers of health data, risk factors, political boundaries, and other geospatial information that is useful to put data into context. Uh, we can also create reproducible documents with R Markdown. Uh, this is a package that can be used to turn our analysis into fully reproducible documents that can be shared with others. So an R Markdown document is just a, a document with the extension RMD that intermingles um, text with R code. And when we execute this document, we see the, 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 the document, the output, where the R code has been executed, and we can see the output. So to write an R Markdown document, uh, first we need to write a header. This may include a title, the author, the date, and the type of output. This can be PDF. Word or, or HTML. Then we need to write text with uh, Markdown syntax. For example, if we want bold text, we put the text between two asterisks. If we want italic text, we put it between one asterisk. We also can have uh, an order list or order list headers of different sizes and we can also write mathematical formulas with latex syntax and then the r code will be written within r code chunks like this and these chunks may have different options for example we may uh, decide if we want to show or hide the code in the output document or if we want to suppress errors, warnings, or messages. Here we have an example. Uh, here we have like a header with the title and the type of output that in this case is HTML. And then we have code uh, written within R chunks and text uh, written with markdown syntax. And then when we need this document, we obtain this uh, HTML document where we have the text that has been formatted. And then we see the code and the output of the code that has been executed. We can also create interactive dashboards with Flex Dashboard and Shiny Web Applications with Shiny. Flex Dashboard uses R Markdown to publish a group of related data visualizations as a dashboard. And Shiny is a web application framework for R that enables to build interactive web applications. So if we want to create a, a dashboard using Flex Dashboard, the first thing to do is to define the layout. So we can say like 
and the number of rows and the number of columns that we want to show. For example, here we have that we have two columns. In the first column, we have one row, and in the second column, we have two rows. And then uh, within each of these charts, we route uh, an R chunk with the code that will produce the visualization that we want to see. And here the output is Flex Dashboard. So it's an R Markdown document uh, with this layout and the, and the output will be Flex Dashboard. We can also use Shiny so the user can interact with the app. And a Shiny app can be built by creating a directory that contains an R file with three components a user interface, a server function, and then a call to Shiny app by providing the user interface and server function pair. So the user interface is the object that controls the layout and appearance of the app. And the server function contains the code to build the objects that we see in the application. And then once we have this, we can save it and then uh, we can run the, the application by calling run app and specifying the path where uh, the uh, directory is. In the Shiny web application, we can put uh, many inputs, for example, inputs to upload files or to enter dates or to enter numeric inputs or text. We can also put sliders to select a range of values. And we can also include outputs such as plots, tables, text, images. And in a little bit more detail, this is what we have. We have the user interface with the components with the widgets that we are going to show in the application with the inputs and the outputs. And then the server function with the code to build the outputs. So the inputs are objects the user can interact with and modify their values. And the outputs are objects that we want to show in the app. And then in the server function, we uh, write the code to build the output. So if uh, this code uses some of the input values that the user has modified, then uh, the output will be revealed whenever the, the user modifies the, the controls, the input values. And this will allow uh, reactivity and uh, the user will be able to interact with the application. So once we have the application, uh, we need to share the application with other people and we have two options. First option is to share the R scripts with other users. So by doing that, other users need to, need to have R, and then they can launch the application by running run app. And the second option is that we put the application as a, web, as a website, and the user can go to the website and use it. And to host the application, uh, we can use it uh, our own servers, or we can use uh, Shiny Apps IO or Shiny Server that are services that are provided by our studio. So here is an example of a dashboard uh, uh, that was created with Flex Dashboard and also including Shiny. Uh, and this shows air pollution globally. And here we have a, a map, a table, and a histogram showing the, the values, and a slider so the user can filter the countries they want to see depending on uh, if the levels of uh, air pollution are within the range of values that the user selected. So here we have a dashboard with uh, three columns, one column with one row, a second column with one row, and a third column with two rows. So in the first column, we have the slider, in the second column, we have the leaflet map. And in the third column, we have a table and a histogram. And here, uh, we allow interactivity by uh, allowing the user to select the values they want to see. So dashboards like this are very useful to identify information for specific regions 
and to understand how disease patterns change over time, compare risks between populations, measure inequalities, and anticipate health threats for better planning and response. And for example, we can build digital web health atlases and surveillance systems that can be shared with others. This is another example of Shiny App. This is a Shiny App created by AfriMap R, that is a project that creates R building blocks to facilitate the use of spatial data in Africa. And in this app, uh, we show um, hospitals and health facilities in Africa. And this is useful for uh, comparing uh, countries and also to inform uh, pandemic response. Now we would like to talk about our resources and communities. And this is uh, especially useful for uh, people that are starting using R. R has uh, many resources to learn. Uh, many of these resources are freely available online. So it has uh, books, videos, cheat sheets, blogs. Also, specific packages have websites where you can find help files and, and vignettes that, that you can use to learn how to use the packages in applications. And um, for example, this is the website of the SF package uh, for um, spatial data. If you are interested in uh, learning how to model uh, spatial data, you can also take a look at my book, Geospatial Health Data, Modeling and Visualization with Arila and Shiny. This book is published by CRC, but it's also freely, freely available online on this link. And here you can learn how to manipulate and transform the spatial data and how to create maps using R. It also shows how to fit and interpret Bayesian models using ILA and SPDE, and how to create interactive visualizations, reproducible reports, dashboards, and shiny web applications that facilitate the communication with collaborators and policymakers. The book focuses on health examples for example, it shows how to model disease risk and quantify risk factors in different settings. But the methods explained are also useful to analyze spatial data that arise in any other discipline, such as ecology or criminology. Also, uh, we may want to join an R community, such as R Forwards or R Ladies. And these are organizations that promote diversity in the art community. And by joining these communities, you will be able to interact with other art users and learn about uh, their work and also learn about events, jobs, and other opportunities. Also, we, we may want to attend uh, art conferences like this one, the US Art Conference, and also many other conferences, for example, Conecta R, that is a meeting for our users in Latin America. And if you're on Twitter, you can follow many interesting accounts of individuals and organizations that use R. And the hashtag for R is RStats. And R spatial is uh, the hashtags uh, of R for spatial. Um, before finishing, uh, I want to mention that I'm looking for PhD students and postdocs to join my group at KAUST. So if you are interested, please uh, get in touch. And um, here there are some references about my work on methods, software, and applications in health and environment. Uh, my good book, Your Spatial Health Data. And let's see, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paola. We have um, we have one question in the Q and A box. Um, it's can we down? Uh, will the slides be available? Uh, yes, I can put the the link now. Okay, thank you. 
Um, if there are any other questions, please submit them in the Q&A box. I'll ask my own question. Um, how easy is it to think about time trends in a, you know, to treat them like spatial trends? And, um, and how much does the time trend, uh, affect, you know, in general? But do you mean, like, we can distinguish between um, explaining some process that has already occurred in the past, and I think this is very easy because we can see what is the statistical model that fits the data. And the other thing is uh, to forecast in the future, and this is much more difficult because, yeah. like, there will be many factors that um, will be able to like will, will, will affect what's happening in the future. So uh, statistical models for um, predicting in the future may work well when we know what are the risk factors. For example, for climate sensitive diseases such as dengue, if we know that it's going to rain and it's going to be an outbreak, or maybe we know the socioeconomic status of um, people in, in different regions, they may work well, but then if we work, uh, if we work modeling things like coronavirus, it's much more difficult because, uh, like coronavirus, is spread by the contact of population, and we don't know how these people are going to to behave in the future. We don't know the the measurements, like the the political the 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 lockdowns or social distancing measures that are going to be applied. So for doing that, maybe we need to resort more to mathematical models that take into, now, into account the dynamics of the disease and we can introduce all of these factors that may occur in the future. Great, thanks. Is it, who are the consumers of uh, applications? Are they you know, politicians, uh, non-experts, or are they more like disease specialists? and? How do you get connect them? So you can everybody. So um, people working in health departments can work with can use these shiny web applications, so they can understand what is the risk of their areas and they can take uh, action if needed. And also uh, the general public, if they want to be informed about the risk uh, they are having in the region, they can go to the to the to the application and see. Um, how what is the the, the overall health in, in the region great okay we've got a few more questions coming in now uh this is a question from corey brunson the current pandemic brought or do the r resources you surveyed include tools to quantify the uncertainty due both to sample size and to bias due to differences in surveillance practices so can you repeat so it's if, if these tools, if, the, if these tools, um, uh, what, what, was, what was the question again? Sorry, let me read it again. The current pandemic brought testing rates to the fore. Do the R resources you survey include tools to quantify uncertainty due to sample size uh, and to bias due to differences in surveillance practices? Yes, so I haven't worked with these tools specifically, but uh, if you go, for example, to the um, Recon website is here. Uh, they have developed uh, from uh, from last year and uh, re in recent years. They have developed many many R packages to monitor the trends and uh, how uh, COVID uh, evolves in time. And they also take into account the uncertainty. So you can take a look at the website, and you will see that there are many 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 tools for doing that. Great. Uh, this is a question from Thomas Sterling. Great talk. Thank you, Paula. Regarding our spatial data, how are these data sets updated? Another regarding epi flows, is the input data a data frame cross-border transmission events? So regarding our spatial data, so we have, uh, I think the last uh, tutorial was written at the beginning of this year 
but we have a, a website. I mean, we have, uh, if you go here, so this is the R Special Data website, and there is a, um, a, a tab that explains uh, how people can can collaborate and how, how can add tutorials. So the, the website is there and the more people get involved, the, 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 the more often will be updated. And the second question was about EpiFlows. What was the question? Is the input data a data border transmission events? The date, so the, the input data uh, will be like for the country uh, that has the, the outbreak, uh, it has uh, like the, the number of infected people, like the, the incubation and infectious period distributions of the disease. And then we need a data frame with all of these population flows. People going from the infectious location to other locations, and people uh, and the flows that come to the to the infected country, like it will be something like this, like all the flows between all the populations. And well, the model um, can be improved if we want to to add more specifics about the disease. But right now, it only uses this slide: number of infectious cases, population flows, lengths of stay, and incubation and infectious period distributions. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a question from Keith Harrison. How do you handle missing data? Well, uh, for example, in INLA, um, so the way that we handle missing data is just uh, by, by predicting this data, like in the data frame, you put NAs and the, the software knows that this needs to be predicted. Great. This is a question from Nicole Swartwood. I develop a web tool allowing users to interface with a model of TB in the United States. One problem we face is proper communication of the technical details with potential users, non-model experts. In your experience, balance equity of act through education on the assumptions included in best use cases in order, in order to prevent misinformation. Well, I think that when we uh, build this type of applications and we want to share with the general public, we need to make it simple to understand. So it, it doesn't need to be false, but it needs to be simple. And what you can do is, for example, like have a, a tab in the application that explains uh, the, the statistical analysis that you have carried out and you can have different levels, like for a very easy understanding uh, or another explanation for people that knows a little bit about the statistics, another information for people that are policymakers, and then each person can go to different tabs and, and read the information they are interested about. Thank you. Okay, and one question left for from June Cho. Thanks for the talk. Geospatial models also inform sampling practices for better data collection beyond its more obvious implication for health policy. Yes, yeah, so you can, it's also possible. Like for example, if in this application, we have these surveys and we obtain this map. So this is the posterior mean. So this is the, the prevalence that we estimated. But uh, besides this map, we also have maps showing the uncertainty, like lower and upper limits. And here, for example, I'm saying that the prevalence in the region maybe is 10%, uh, but uh, there will be other maps showing uh, what is uh, the uncertainty. And maybe it's 10%, but goes between five and 25 or maybe between zero and 100 if we don't know anything at all so it's important that we look at the uncertainty maps and if we are very uncertain in the in some specific regions we can go uh, and say to the people that collect the data okay uh, we have created this map but in the region uh, we are not sure about what is happening and here we need to increase to increase 
uh, sampling. We need more data. And we can also do that looking at the uncertainty maps. Okay, thank you. There's one more question from Dennis Shaw. What are your thoughts on different methods for spatial downscaling? For example, Krigging versus Inla. Um, well, um, so I think for downscaling, the the method that like, so the, the approach that you follow is one thing, and then the tool that you use to fit the model is another thing. So here, for example, if we want to, uh, construct a, spe a spatially continuous surface from this map, we can assume that underlying all of these um, uh, observations, there is a spatially continuous process. And then we can uh, specify a model that links the aerial data with the uh, spatially continuous surface behind uh, using integrals. And this is the model. This is the, the downscaling uh, method and then we can fit the model di using different statistical packages. We can use uh, INLA, we can use MCMC, we can use Krigging, and then the choice of these tools will depend on on the preferences you have. Like for example, INLA will be faster than MCMC, but maybe MCMC will be more flexible and you will you will be able to put more um, um, calibrate calibration parameters or random effects. So I think it's like um, the model will be the same, but the, the tools you use to fit the model are the ones that are going to change and it depends on your preferences on, on the objectives that you have. Great. Those are all of the questions. Are there any are there any additional questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, well, let's thank Paula and I really appreciate you agreeing to come and, and give our, our first plenary talk and thank you so much. Um, thank you so much and, and I hope you continue enjoying the conference. All right, thank you. We'll go ahead and adjourn now. Please everyone uh, join us for the, the speed networking session um, this, uh, this afternoon and uh, we'll see you later. <laughs>